Hello, Global Gardeners. Happy Monday. It's time to start your gardening week. And today, we're going to talk about gardening burnout. Many of us have experienced burnout at work, and one of the things that is suggested is we get a hobby. Well, what happens when our hobby, gardening, actually can cause burnout with something that we're supposed to be enjoying, we're supposed to be having fun with, and then it just becomes overwhelming and a burden. So we'll be talking about some of that today. I'll be sharing some of my ideas, and I'm also looking for tips from you because gardening burnout is something that I think hits all of us at one point or another. It might be just for a few moments. It might be for just a day. Sometimes it might be even longer term than that. And as important as gardening is for so many of us, we really should try to avoid the burnout so that we can get to the reason why we garden. And that's what we talked about last week, is trying to identify why we garden, because that's often a big solution when you're dealing with gardening burnout. Shout out to Janelle M. Welcome to the channel. Nice to see so many people checking in from all over the world already. Looks like Jean-Pierre from Belgium might be joining us in the replay and not on the live, but that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Shandy's Garden, starting everything later the way I did. I'm not burned out yet. That's awesome. And so the the idea behind burnout, the, the definition when, when we talk about it, usually work-related, is that it's, it's an emotional or a physical or even mental stress. You just, you just feel overwhelmed. Often it leads to feelings of just being tired, overworked, your motivation is down, you've got lowered performance, you start having negative feelings, and we've all felt that with one level or another at some time in our lives. The problem is when it comes to gardening, the reason why many of us garden is because we like it, because we enjoy the positive feelings. We like the exercise. We like the diversion. All of those are things that, that you should be choosing to do to deal with work burnout. Well, gardening for many of us actually ends up becoming more like work because there are just so many things to do you got your seeds you got your weeds you got your watering you got your weather you got all that stuff that just makes gardening more than an easy activity well break it down to the simplest components the why why you garden. If you garden because you just enjoy being out in nature, when you start feeling those burnout moments, just go outside and just sit in your garden and enjoy the nature moment. And that can help you maybe get realigned and get back on track. If you're doing exercise or if you're doing gardening for exercise, and you find out that you're just getting overworked and you're tired and you're sore and your muscles hurt more than they ever did, well, maybe it's time to just take a break. And so I'll be revisiting that over the course of today's discussion. It's okay to take a break from gardening as long as you need. For some of us, a day or two, maybe a week, maybe months, but whatever it takes, you don't have to feel guilty because you're taking a break from gardening, especially if you're on a group like this where we're talking gardening every week and everybody's excited and we're sharing our stories and you feel like maybe you're inadequate and not measuring up because you don't have that positive motivation. Don't worry about it. It hits all of us. So as we proceed, Throw out your tips, your comments. When you've encountered gardening burnout, what did you do? How did you fix it? How did you move forward? And let's see what some of the things we have. Jessica is saying how odd it is that I just was thinking, why do I have no more energy for it? 
and this video notification came across the phone. <clears throat> yeah, it's 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 totally normal. It's one of those things that that we look forward to so much. We want to get out in our garden. We want to get those plants growing. We want to harvest. We want the flowers. We want the bees. We want all of that. And then all of a sudden it hits and it can become overwhelming because of the pruning and the weeds and the weather and everything else. And suddenly you find out that you don't have the energy. Today, this is my garden behind me. Took it this morning, just a couple hours ago, and I'm starting to feel overwhelmed. These are the peppers back here. These are squashes. These are some squashes and cucumbers. There's more cucumbers back here. There's more squashes back here. The tomatoes are over my head. And this is just part of my garden. I'm beginning to feel overwhelmed just staying up with the harvest. And after months and months and months of no rain, we've had rain almost every day for the last two or three weeks, which now means the weeds are going crazy. So while I can keep up with the weeds in my garden beds, the weeds outside my beds are driving me crazy because I can't keep up with them. It is becoming overwhelming to the point that even I am ready to just throw up my hands and say, I don't have the energy like Jessica's talking about. I just feel sometimes like it's just too much work. So what do you do? Take a break. So last week, that's what I did. And I'll share with you at the end some of what I did. But I took a break from my garden. I took some time off. I figured the weeds are going to grow. Let the weeds grow. If the, the harvest isn't completely harvested, that's okay. I can deal with that. It's those kind of moments where you recognize that if I don't do something now, if I don't take some time off now, the whole thing's going to blow up and I'm either going to go crazy, I'm going to try to get all the work done and end up being totally exhausted to the point that I can't do anything else or parts of the garden suffer which is more important your mental health or parts of the garden so if the weeds become a little overwhelming it's no big deal it's overwhelming i will find time at some point to deal with those issues if i'm not able to harvest every single squash it's okay i've already harvested over 50 pounds of squash what's another couple squashes so what if they stay on the plant and that's kind of the way I approach some of these burnout issues is, so what if something goes wrong? So what if the plant I wanted to prune doesn't get pruned? So what if I go out to collect the tomatoes and the birds have already gotten to them? So what? Your health, your mental health is more important than a few things in the garden. And then when you get realigned and you have the energy again, now you can attack it with maybe twice what you were doing before. The, the thing about the gardening burnout is it becomes a little insidious where you do a lot and then you kind of get tired and you get a little worn out and you do a little bit less and then you start realizing you're not enjoying it and you do a little bit less and then you suddenly get to the point that many people get to that you just quit because it's just not fun anymore. That's why taking a break sometimes can reset your energy clock, reset your gardening attitude, and then you can get back to it and have twice as much energy as you had before you got into the whole burnout situation. Sunset Gazing is saying, enjoying on a breezy overcast morning with bumblebees and hummingbirds. These Monday live streams are a great, great way to sit and contemplate what needs to be done next. With recent rains, things are blooming. And and that's that's a big part of how I approach it as well. Like I said, sometimes just sit in your garden and yeah, contemplate. Contemplate what needs to be done. And then you can prioritize. And there are so many things we do in the garden that 
really aren't that important and they really can be left out for a day or two in our normal gardening tasks and then we get back to it and everything is fine now one of the suggestions for job burnout if you have an issue where you're actually dealing with with burnout is to practice mindfulness the idea that you do just try to get emotionally centered as possible and acknowledge the why you do things and get back to that initial reason of gardening in the first place if you're gardening for food and it becomes nothing but work that's that's one issue but if you're gardening for fun and it's no longer fun it's the mindfulness it's the slowing down and the stopping and the recognizing you still have all of those things around you that bring you enjoyment sometimes we just become blind to them and another big aspect of dealing with the burnout because things are just happening all the time and it's crazy and we don't know what to do but to establish a schedule many of us garden with a schedule we go outside at 6 30 to water or we come home after work to water and we have certain things we're doing in the garden well, really try to focus on that aspect of having a schedule where maybe you don't have the motivation maybe you are a bit tired well if you have a schedule where it's time to get out and water don't look at it as a chore now that oh it's time to water i gotta go water the garden that's how burnout becomes so insidious instead look forward to it over the course of the day you're at work and you're dealing with all those issues you bring the kids home from school you finish dinner whatever it happens to be use that garden time as an incentive because it's going to be time oh only an hour to go and i get to get outside and water the garden oh only half an hour and i get to go see what i'm harvesting for dinner tonight so you can bring that into it that structure of the the gardening activities as part of a schedule can also be a way to deal with some of those those burnout issues as well jay dixon of course is always on top of things gardening burnout tip number four switch things up to get a second win great idea you know the the brain is funny that way most of us when we have that schedule of the watering or whatever the task happens to be we'll do it left to right front to back we always water the same plants the same way every day jay's right switch it up even with something as simple as watering start from the back and work right to left <clears throat> and that's actually an approach i use on a daily basis when I'm when I'm watering my garden I will water front to back and then I leave the hose in place in the back so that the next time I water I water back to front so it's the same activity that I do on a pretty regular schedule but each day it's a little bit different and that little bit of difference is enough to sometimes help you avoid the monotony and because it's often the monotony that can lead to some of these burnout issues now Rick is saying I try to do gardening each afternoon <coughs> for an hour before it gets dark so it becomes more of routine it was weed day today great idea and that's another thing rather than than do the same thing every day which is why it becomes a chore break it up a little bit and so uh today is weed day so monday is weed day and tuesday is prune day and wednesday is add extra mulch day and all of those chores that need to be done now become a special activity in the garden and so don't look at it as oh man i got a weed today it's like oh it's it's monday today's weed day and the nice thing about that is that means tomorrow is not weed day and Wednesday is not weed day because you've already identified that it's something else for those days. So you break up the activities that you happen to need to do 
and make it as as different or uh, something you can look forward to as much as possible. Masabi Gal says, I was depressed looking at an area I needed to weed and prep to plant, and I decided to fence it off and let the chickens take care of it. Great idea. Exactly. If, if you're feeling depressed about it and starting to feel that stress, come up with other options. I like the idea that those chickens, because the chickens will definitely take care of the weeding and eating the weed seeds as well. So that's a wonderful solution. I like that. Good suggestion, Jay. Tip number six, ask for help. Yeah, I, I'm one of those gardeners that I like to do it all myself. And that can quickly become overwhelming. And it can be as simple as just asking your, your partner, your kids, a neighbor, anybody for just a hand, just a little bit of that extra help. Even if just for a couple minutes, that can really make a difference. But especially for those big tasks, uh, don't think you have to do it all yourself. I, I talk all the time about sharing the gardening experience. Well, a chore that needs to be done can just as easily be something that you share with someone else and now becomes a gardening opportunity, an opportunity for you to share your garden with someone else as they help you out with whatever the task happens to be. So I like that idea. Shandy's garden is letting my yard go crazy. I'll be putting my weed whacking chicks on it in the spring. That's good. Yeah, I've just let my front yard go crazy and <clears throat> spend a couple days weeding with the the weed whacker and the same in the backyard a couple days devoted to it and and i do it in phases it doesn't all have to be done at the same time so there are sections of my yard that really do look crazy i'm a bit embarrassed by it, but but i've got to keep my sanity so i'm going to do it when i do it Ryan says, this is the time of year I take a good look at this year's garden and start thinking about changes for next year. It breaks up this year's monotony. Great tip. Great idea. If this year is getting monotonous, if it's getting tiring, if you're, you're feeling that stress, yeah, look at next year. I, I do a lot of that. And I've said that before. I'm constantly thinking about what the garden's going to be next year based on what's happening this year and when you look to the future and start thinking and start making those plans that's a great way to deal with burnout because burnout is just a temporary event it's just happening right now and we'll get through it and we'll get over it and one of the ways to get over right now is to look at tomorrow and i like that idea brian thanks Mornings at the allotment. I've managed to keep everything alive in the extreme heat and drought this summer by extensive watering. So yeah, the weeds grew like crazy, crazy, but I try to focus on the positives to prevent burnout. Good, good idea, good suggestion. Because when we're we're trying to grow something, and, and I've seen a lot of comments like that recently, people growing plants, the plants are doing great, but they're just not getting the harvest. The, the fruit just isn't setting and the focus now becomes on the negative it becomes the man i spent all this time on these plants and i haven't even harvested anything yet well stop and take a moment and realize the plants are doing great so you did something right to get the plants to where they are right now and that's a positive that's something to look forward to and i saw a picture on on our facebook group today of that single pepper, those plants that were doing great and nothing was happening. And then there's that one pepper that's emerging. That's what should be getting your attention. Don't look at it as only one pepper on my plants, but instead look like, oh, look how beautiful that pepper is. Look how that pepper has overcome all of the obstacles. And I'm trying to decide when's the best time to harvest it. The positive is a great way to approach it. So I like that. Valerie says, first garden and everything either didn't produce, got fungus, were eaten by such as leaf turners, pumpkins are hanging in, all persist, but it can be frustrating. Yeah, it can be frustrating, especially in your first garden, especially for, for new gardeners. It's hard. There are a lot of challenges. There's the fungus. There's the pest. There's the weather. There's all that stuff that get, can go wrong. So... I, I feel your pain, Valerie. It is frustrating, but 
look for those positives. Look for those things that you, you can highlight this year. And then also, like we just talked about, next year. If things were going wrong this year, if you had those issues, now it's like, okay, in winter, I'm going to learn more about the fungus that affected my plant so that next year I'm not going to have that issue. And in spring, I'm going to choose varieties that are resistant to the diseases that hit my garden this year. That's a great way. Just already start deciding that it's a setback. It's frustrating. It can definitely be annoying. It can definitely be stressful. And it can it can be serious enough that you're questioning whether you want to keep going with the gardening. Well, of course, keep going with the gardening. <clears throat> but look to next year for what's going to happen. <laughs> and it sounds crazy. This year's not working, so I got to think about a whole nother year where things may also go wrong. Well, yeah, that's part of <laughs> what gardening is all about, is planning for the future and looking for the future. And so don't don't necessarily use that as a crutch where everything's terrible. I'm going to rip everything out and start over again next year. That could be a solution, but do focus on the moment. Do try to see the positives and to, to, do try to enjoy the moment as much as you can. Hi, Colorado Bird Nerd. Thank you so much for that super chat. <clears throat> Thank you for making me realize it's not just me. Once I get out there, those shishito peppers make me smile. Absolutely. It isn't just you. That's why I, I said all of us encounter this to one degree or another. And you it's pretty much, at least for me, every gardening year, I have those moments of starting to get burned out. It's just too much to do, too much to think about. And you got to stop. And all of us go through it. So, yes, it's not just you. It's all of us. And I agree with you. I've got shishito peppers growing in my green stock towers right now. And I'm debating on when I'm going to harvest them over the course of the next couple of days because they're beautiful. And it's those things. It's those. It's the anticipation. I, I did that video last year about making the shishito peppers, grilling them in a pan and how delicious they are. Well, that's on my mind. So I can look at the shishito peppers today and anticipate today and tomorrow and the next day how delicious those peppers are going to be when I finally harvest them. And so rather than look at the whole garden, that's just so overwhelming. There's just too much to do and I feel burned out. Oh, wait, but those shishito peppers are going to be perfect in two days, that's going to make everything worthwhile. And that's how I get through my burnout. It's just picking those little moments and relishing the enjoyment of that moment. And shishito peppers are a great way to relish it because, yeah, they make me smile too. I, I completely agree with you on that aspect of it. Shishito peppers are just incredible. Okay, let's see. Skippy Dugan had my best year ever for tomatoes and my trellis structure a little stressed. Storm came through and it collapsed, tried to fix it but couldn't. I left it on the ground and the plant's still producing. Awesome. Yeah, sometimes, you know, things don't go as you had planned, but the plants will persevere and let them do their thing. So good for you. I've had a um, I, I've, I've just started harvesting my tomatoes. My peppers are doing great. I'm having a good year with tomatoes as well. And uh, I have no doubt I'll have some storms come through and try to take away my enjoyment, but I'm gonna let the plants do what they do and harvest the tomatoes as well. Cap Cat says, I'm a new gardener learning so much. I'm so excited I learned that the coddling moth was ruining my apples in the past. This year I bagged all the apples and so far so good. Good for you. Another great way to approach it. <coughs> When something goes wrong, figure out how to fix it. And that fix now becomes the enjoyment that you can focus on. So excellent. I'm so glad you, you learned that and that you've got the apples that you were looking for. That's, that's the way to do it. Eric is saying, I have only two tomato plants and had only eight tomatoes, but they were probably the best tomatoes I ever had. There you go. Yeah, 
you don't have to have a big harvest to enjoy your harvest. And I've, I've said this before, I think, was it last week, a couple weeks ago, I was talking about the melon, the cantaloupe, the best I've ever eaten. It was an accident. I only had one melon, but man, it was so good. And, and I've had plants like that in the past as well, where I had a very small harvest, but man, the harvest was good. That makes it worthwhile. So there you go. Brian says, a friend sent me a plum tree. Finally got hardened off. Today's planting day breaks the daily routine of gardening. <clears throat> There's, that's another great suggestion. To The scheduling is a good way to approach burnout because it gets your mind focused. It gets you thinking about what you need to do, and you can look forward to that. But throwing in those unique tasks, those new activities, another great way. One of the ways I deal with the burnout uh, is um, I've actually bought plum trees and apple trees to put in the ground in in fall. Fall can be a good time, or late summer can be a good time to put fruit trees in like Brian is doing. And exactly that. If I start feeling like the garden is just getting overwhelming, don't know what to do, it's the same chore hey, day in, day out, I'll go to the nursery and walk around and look for something new, something different, something to break up the chores of gardening. And yeah, you get, you get a new plant, then you figure out where it needs to go, and you plant it, and you care for it, and you've broken the monotony of that day-to-day -day chore, which can lead to the burnout in the first place. So I like that idea. That's one of those things that can really be helpful. Mary just went through 40 plus tomatoes again to remove disease, prune and tie up, carried out over five gallon bags of, uh, or five gallons of foliage. Harvest is just getting into the swing, hoping most plants will last a frost. I hope they do too. They, you know, today, to, this day happens to me every year. And so hoping the plants will last a frost Today was the first day of the season that I'm hoping my plants will last to the frost as well. I, I live in the shadow of Pikes Peak in the Rocky Mountains, and last night we had snow on Pikes Peak. Now, it's beautiful down here. The temperatures are great. It's a nice, warm, sunny day. The forecast is supposed to be nice and warm and sunny for the future, but... For those of us in this area who pay attention, traditionally, we have our first freeze down here on the flatlands about a month after the first snow on Pikes Peak. And it's, it's a general guideline, but it happens to be true more often than not. So that means if the pattern, that trend that is historical is true, I've only got a month left in my garden and I'm just now starting to harvest tomatoes and just now starting to harvest the peppers. So I've got a month and I should be able to have some pretty good harvests in the next month, but I may only have a month left in my season. That by itself can be depressing. That by itself is enough to cause burnout because it's like, well, why even try? I've only got a month left. But instead, I look at it as like, okay, I got to pack everything into this month as much as possible because it might be an early freeze this year. Okay, I can deal with that. I can get everything ready to go. I already have the hoops over my bed so that I can throw the plastic covers on them when that first frost threatens. I'm, I'm prepared and I'll become even more prepared as the forecast gets closer to that fateful day of the first frost. But for right now, I'm trying to enjoy everything I can, knowing that it's coming, knowing that I'm fighting with the burnout, but recognizing that this is a great time of year for me in my garden because the season is so short and everything is at its peak. Yankee sister, nice to see you back. Having groundhog burnout starting in spring 
I had to totally rearrange part of my garden. Thank goodness for containers. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah, the Yankee sister's been battling the groundhogs for months now. And I, th I think we we all had suggested and she had agreed on the the containers and raised beds and some of those issues. So I'm glad to see that rearranging the garden is, is working for you. So hope you have some really good success in the days ahead. And nice to see you here. And thank you, of course, for that super chat. I always appreciate it. Okay, let's catch up with some of the comments. This is one of those things that, uh, especially the more experienced you are, or I should say the more time you spend gardening over the years, this crops up more and more. Just the idea that you're tired, that you're done, you're, you're ready to give it up. And, you know, I've got videos, I talk about succession planting, how you can start in early spring, harvest crops, do your summer plantings, do more plants and seeds, have a fall garden. That's not for everybody. And <clears throat> and I'm kind of cutting back on my fall garden this year because of some of that burnout. It's like I've been going strong for months now, and I love it, but I don't want to get burned out. I don't want it to become too much of a chore. So some of those beds that I was going to do some more plantings in, eh, I'll do some, but I won't do as much as I was planning because it's been a pretty hard year and a lot of work. So it's okay to give yourself permission to do a little bit less. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Janelle Gim says, coming from Ontario, Canada, I'm in the midst of moving houses, so I currently only have a small container garden using it to experiment with seed saving. Good idea. Good, good suggestion. That's I, I have a video on that for three years ago. That's exactly what I did when I moved to this new house. As I was figuring out the garden space and planning it, I just did some container gardening that first year using some five-gallon buckets and some grow bags. And great, great way to keep gardening during a move, but also to experiment with seed saving. That's a wonderful idea. So I, I like that. Uh, Brian, thank you for that. Uh, the garden looks wonderful. Yeah, I'm very pleased. One of the reasons I wanted to show this picture today is uh, not so much for the garden because I showed that a couple weeks ago and talked about just how happy I am with it. But I wanted to highlight the the sunflowers. I, I, I really like sunflowers. You know, the thumbnail for these weekly live streams uh, are some sunflowers I grew years ago. I just really like sunflowers in my garden. And the sunflowers in all over the garden, there's some over there, there's some over there, there's some in the back, there's these over here. I've got a whole nother section off to the side filled with sunflowers. For me, that's one of those things that I use to combat that burnout. That I, I, I know it's usually about this time of year that I just feel overwhelmed with everything I have to do in the garden. But when I go out and see the sunflowers in bloom, it just makes me feel good. It gives me that 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 warm, fuzzy feeling that as as bad as it feels in the moment, as much as the work needs to be done, as tired as I am from all the weeding, if I can just sit and look at my sunflowers, I'm I'm good. I'm re-energized. Everything is right in the world and in my garden because of the sunflowers that, that are growing around me. So think about that aspect of it. What is it in your garden that gives you that extra little bit of joy? Is it a plant? Is it a, a, a garden gnome? Is it a wind chime? Whatever it is, take advantage of that and just spend some time in that space and that can be a great way to energize your garden jay has gardening burnout tip number 12 and i know i've missed some of these so i'll have to go back and read them again for every problem sit in a cozy place and think of a solution there you go yeah we talked a little bit about that already the short and the long term <clears throat> but yeah get your brain focused on something other than the problem if you just think about the problem and just focus on it as a problem, you're going to go crazy. But thinking about the solution is a great idea. So I, I, 
I like that one as well. Thanks, Jay. Logi, Yogi Lai, love my sunflowers. They're glorious. The teddy bear ones are super cool and new to me. Yeah, teddy bear is a good variety of sunflower to grow. I completely agree with you. And you're right, Hant House, the head sunflowers bring in finches. And that's a big reason why I grow them. I grow them and I leave them up into winter for the seeds, for the birds. And then at some point, I'll, I'll cut them down in late winter, early spring as I'm cleaning up the garden. So, yes, that's a big reason why I'm growing them. But because after growing them for the birds, I recognize how much I like them. Dual purpose. Absolutely a great, great plant to grow in the garden, at least for me. You, you should decide, and it might be some flowers, which you like to grow. It might be roses. It might be daffodils. It might be anything it might be a combination it might be a color think of a garden a, a purple garden <clears throat> and I, I did this last year in my vegetable garden with my purple plants every time i came out and i saw the purple green beans and the purple potatoes and the purple kohlrabi everything purple in that bed that just gave me a little bit of a boost just seeing all that purple in one bed so lots of ways to 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 deal with that Heidi <coughs> loves interacting with the dragonflies that come to the garden. Yeah, focus on the, the insects. Have you, have you ever taken the time to really look at the bees in your garden? How many kinds of bees do you have? On my salvia plants, I've got salvia in a couple different areas in my garden daily. I'll see at least two, usually three or four, sometimes five or six different species of bee on the same plant that's another way to just leave the gardening world behind all that chore and just immerse yourself into the insect world for a few minutes and so heidi loves interacting with the dragonflies i love interacting with the bees and just seeing what who's coming to visit so yeah another great great idea great tip to get more involved and more focused on what's happening in the garden. <coughs> National Jones says, watching your videos helps me to stay inspired, Gardner Scott. I'm glad to hear that. Also, tomato sandwiches and watching the hummingbirds at the feeder. There you go. I've been enjoying the hummingbirds this year as well. Uh, I, I did a, a, a short video on it a couple weeks ago. I'm just so happy that my hummingbirds are coming to the garden, not for the feeder, but for the flowers. They actually spend more time at my flowers than they do at the feeder. And that just, oh, I'm just so thrilled by that. But yeah, absolutely enjoy. And I'm looking forward to my tomato sandwich soon. I'm not quite there yet, but uh, I'm glad you're enjoying the videos and your tomato sandwiches. But yeah, hummingbirds. If you don't have a hummingbird feeder, put up a hummingbird feeder. Most of us live in regions with hummingbirds. And so you'd be surprised that if you don't see a hummingbird, but you put a feeder up, they may discover it. it. may take a while, but especially if you've got flowers in your garden, you'd be surprised that suddenly that hummingbird feeder is host to one, two, five, six. You never know how many hummingbirds are going to show up. So that's awesome. Shandy's garden loves the sound of the solar fountain. Yep, absolutely from the Dollar Tree parts, except for the $15 solar fountain on Amazon, and got the idea from Robbie's channel. <coughs> yeah, I've got a couple videos on the solar fountains, because I completely agree with you. I always like to have a solar fountain in my garden, and I'll swap them out from time to time and, and try different types of fountains, but the, the sound of that water, and especially when the birds and the insects discover the fountain as well, Oh, I just love sitting by the fountain and hearing the buzz of the insects and the chirps of the birds and the, the sound of the water. Oh, I completely agree. That, that's a great way to enjoy the garden space. SJK, thank you so much for that super chat. When picking beans, does it matter if you remove the entire stem tip from the plant or do you just snap the bean off at the top and leave the stem tip? So a lot of it depends on how soon you're going to eat the bean if you are harvesting beans for that day 
then yeah, you can snap the bean off and leave the top on the plant and go into the kitchen and fix the beans. If you are going to store them for any time, a day, if you're harvesting the beans today, but you're not going to fix them until tomorrow or the next day or next week, then you should try to get the, the, the top of the pod and that little bit of stem attached to it. And all you need to do is just take your, your thumb. If you put your thumb at the top of the bean, right where it connects with the stem, you can usually figure out how you can just kind of do a, a pinch, twist, pull, and just snap the bean right off and have the top of the bean along with that little bit of stem. And that's important because that's needed to store. If you snap the bean off without the top, it's now open. It's going to dry out quickly. It might even begin shriveling up pretty fast. And that's why you'll need to use it right away. But do try to get into the habit of, of getting the whole bean, especially if you got a lot of beans. And, and, and they'll store better. And it gives you a little more flexibility in when you prepare them without having to do it right away. So that would be my suggestion for you. Uh, let's see what else we have. Masabi Gal found a solar fountain that has lights and flows at night. Oh, I love that idea. Especially after a hard day in the garden, you're getting burned out, you're not sure if you want to do it anymore, and then you can go out and sit in the garden at night. We've talked about that off and on for the last couple months about having a night garden space and have some lights in your garden for that evening and nighttime activity of just sitting. So good for you. I, and, and yes, I have no doubt you love it because that is something that really can be quite enjoyable. Urban Chicken Mama has different seating areas around the garden so I can sit back and enjoy the garden. Great idea. And watch all the insects and bird activities and great way to re-energize. There you go. So, so especially for you new gardeners out there, uh, maybe you can see a trend. A lot of us are just sitting in the garden enjoying the space as a way to re-energize. And like in the case of Urban Chicken Mama, and I do the same thing, designing your garden with different areas to sit because each room of your garden is a different spot and has a different energy and it has different sounds and different smells and just a completely different atmosphere. So design your garden to have different places to sit. I like that idea. Odom's Homestead, I'm not really a gardener. Yes, I grow a garden, but fruit trees, berry plants, banana and citrus and guava is my passion and what keeps me inspired. You're a gardener. Whether you think you are or not, you are a gardener. Having that passion, regardless of what the plant type is, I beg to differ. I think you are a gardener. And the fruit trees, berries, bananas, citrus, guava, they're, they're not easy to grow. Even if you live in a region where, where obviously like you, ha has that, that weather, that tropical aspect that can support those plants, there's still a lot that can go wrong. But by having the passion and by growing them, and you're you're a gardener so don't say you're not really a gardener i say embrace it embrace that you are a gardener because you're obviously doing things that you need to do and you're here with the rest of us so uh, i look forward to seeing what you have to share with your your fruit pursuits pursuits in the future because a lot of us can't grow those type of plants and i love hearing from people that are growing those tropical plants so good for you and thanks for joining in. I appreciate it. Josh says, in years past, I'd feel burnout when excess produce was going to waste. Yeah, absolutely. This year, canning is the fix. Just canned 41 jars of pickles, peppers, and carrots yesterday. It's a lot of work, but beautiful. Good for you, Josh. I completely agree. The, the overwhelming produce that can happen at different times of year in different regions whenever it hits yeah, I, last year I had a problem with that as well. I was harvesting so much and I couldn't give it away. And so much of what I was harvesting ended up in the compost pile. And it was, it, it was overwhelming. And I did have that moment of burnout. Like, why am I doing this? Why am I growing so much when it's going to waste? And learning to preserve and learning to save it, it is a great solution, especially a few months from now, 
when you're not out in the garden, you're starting to get winter burnout, and you can pull out one of those jars and remember what you just did with the growing and the harvesting and the canning. Oh yeah, that's a great way to fight the burnout when you're actually not in your garden, the, the non-gardening garden burnout because you can't be there. So good for you, good for you. Yeah, and we've talked about that periodically in the last couple months as well, about learning to preserve your food. And uh, think about that now. If you're starting to feel some of those burnout moments, shift your energy, use your brain, learn that new thing, do that planning, look to the future, and preserving your food could definitely fit into that as well. That's one of those things that uh, could, could change your whole season by just having some of what you grew preserved in the months ahead. Abernathy Ra, I find it better to have one goal for the day and then attack it. Good idea. If I go outside and look for something that needs to be done, then I'll quickly get overwhelmed. Oh, I like that idea. And, th and that kind of plays in with the, the scheduling and choosing a day like Monday is weeding day. So yes, I, I, I completely agree. That's a great idea. And, and I do a lot of that as well, where I know that there are tasks to be done and, and at the beginning of the week, I will try to determine when I'm going to get that done and attack it, absolutely. And, and use your energy in that direction to overcome that negative energy that was starting to lead to the burnout. So good suggestion, I, I appreciate that and I completely agree that you, it, it's that focus it's it's looking at that one thing and it helps you forget even for a little bit all of the other things because it's all those other things that can be so overwhelming and it's focusing on the on the one thing that centers you back to where you want to be in the garden <coughs> okay jay's up already up to tip number 16 if you have too much produce to process, give it away quickly and bask in the positive energy from the other people. I love that idea. I gave away a whole bunch of stuff this last week, and you're right. <coughs> I did not bask as much as I should have in the positive energy. So that's a good one. I'm going to try to do more of that. I like giving it away, but sometimes giving it away becomes a chore, and you lose sight of what you're giving to the other person and the fact that they're happy. So yeah, I, great, great tip, Jay. Focus on their positive energy and help it come back to you. I think that's a great way to do it. Um, Brian's wondering, <coughs> what do you have going on in your greenhouse? So right now I've got some tomatoes. In fact, the very first tomatoes that I ate this year were in the greenhouse. I, I had that in a short earlier this week. And I've got hot peppers that are growing in the greenhouse. Uh, like the super hot peppers. And then I also have some potatoes growing in the greenhouse. So I'm hoping to do a video about that. Oh, in the next probably month or so, because the potatoes were started a little bit late. So they'll be a little bit late to harvest. <coughs> One of the ideas being you've probably heard that you're not supposed to grow potatoes and tomatoes together. Well, I'm trying to show that, yes, you can. And that's what I'm doing in my greenhouse. I'm growing potatoes right next to my tomatoes. And I scoff at that warning that you shouldn't do it. Now, the reason that you shouldn't do it is because potato diseases can transfer to the other and back and forth. So potato diseases can transfer to tomatoes and tomato diseases can transfer to potatoes. And so I, I talked about this recently where the, the idea that, that you garden because of disease, I think is, is a faulty way to approach gardening. And so there are so many things we're told not to do because of the disease. Well, if you don't have the disease in your garden and if you're doing everything you can to avoid bringing disease into your garden, then you can get away with an awful lot. So the potatoes that I'm growing in my greenhouse are actually from the potatoes that I grew last year. Those potatoes last year were disease free. 
So I can use the little seed potatoes that I saved for this year and know they don't have diseases. The tomato plants I'm growing in my greenhouse, I started from seed. They're disease free. So I can grow my potatoes and my tomatoes together in the same spot in my greenhouse without worrying about either one transferring diseases back and forth. So hopefully I'll have that video made for you in another month or so. And I'll be talking about what I just talked about, but also about soil and and growing in a greenhouse. So that's all I've got growing right now. One of my tasks, one of my chores, and I have to pick a day to do it, is to actually build the bench that I need to put on the other end of the greenhouse. And I, I just haven't had the time. I've been overwhelmed. So I'm trying to figure out when I can do that to build my greenhouse bench so that I can start plants and harden off plants and do those kind of things next year. So that's coming. So um, I'm really only using half of my greenhouse right now, Brian, uh, but but it's awesome. And so you can see some of that if you watch that short that I made the, earlier this week to see some of those plants growing in the greenhouse and they're doing great. I, I'm really happy. Uh, Peggy says, go out in the garden and see what went right and start planning for next year. Absolutely. We are building more raised beds now. This helps to overcome burnout by looking to the future. Yep, absolutely. And and that's that's a good way to approach it as well. When you, when you look at this season, and even if it's overwhelming, the, the tasks, when you break it down and you recognize what's working and what you want to do more of, you may actually do more next year than you're doing this year, but sometimes having that, that shift. So like in Peggy's case, doing more raised beds for next year, great way to shift the focus from this year, anticipate what you're doing next year, and you're ready for it. You, you already know what, what's happened this year. Now you're planning, even if it's more next year, you can help lessen the burnout by just being prepared because of the planning that takes place. So I love that. TJ the Hawk gave my barber a big bag of heirloom tomatoes from my garden and he gave me a free haircut. Score! That's awesome. I, I like that idea. I, I uh, was actually planning to do the same thing to, to give uh, tomatoes when I have a nice good harvest to, to mine as well. I wasn't even thinking about a free haircut, but that's, I wasn't planning to do it for the free haircut, but yeah. Free haircut has a has a benefit. <laughs> that, that's awesome. I, I, I obviously I think your barber's going to be getting a lot more tomatoes in the future. That's a great way to do it. So three gardens. <clears throat> I had to pull all my zinnias and cosmos yesterday too to powdery mildew, and you know, and that's you know, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that because I love the cosmos and zinnias, but yes, they reach a point where it is time, especially when the powdery mildew sets in. And that's one of those things that, that can add to that feeling of just the burnout, just too many things to do. They were going so good. Now I got to burn them out. Now I got the powdery mildew. Now I got the disease. And sometimes just taking that action rather than watching the plants fade and suffer, pull them. It's that task. It's that activity to get you refocused. So uh, I, I'm glad that you you did that because that was probably a good solution for the problem. And it also takes the problem out of your view so you can start looking at the other things, those other positive aspects that, that should deserve part of your attention as well. So I, I think that's one of those things to, to appreciate. Gardens happen. I'm planning to grow a bunch of radishes this year. Never grew radishes before, so I'm trying a bunch of different varieties to see what I like. Good for you. I, I like that idea. Yeah, the let's see, this year I grew the um the french breakfast radish and i had daikon radish and i had the cherry bell radish i think i just did those three but that's a great idea i love growing different radishes in particular because they grow so quickly and you can see how you can see in a pretty quick way how they grow differently so like the cherry bells will be ready to harvest in three or four weeks and the french breakfast often take four or five weeks and the daikon will take five or six weeks. And so that's a great way to not only enjoy different types of radishes, but also see how they grow differently as you're trying the different varieties. So good for you. Good luck with that. That's, that's a nice plant to, 
experiment with and have some fun with as well. Okay, let's see. Uh, looks like D Jay Dixon and Heidi, of course, are always so active, such great moderators, and always nice to have you all here every week. Joe's Crayon says, I love watching your streams as always. Also, how was your week? So I'll actually talk more about my week as we get to the end. Um, it, it, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And so I'll talk more about that as, as we get to the end because that's how I'll finish up the, the show today. But thank you for asking and stick around for a little bit more. And I'll actually share a lot about my week because it, it was a pretty eventful week on, on both ends of the spectrum. Karen is asking, can you eat beets raw? What do they taste like? Oh, absolutely. In fact, <clears throat> I love putting raw beets in a salad. Now, depending on the beet, so red beets in particular, I think have a really earthy and sometimes almost dirty taste to them. And so when I put them in a salad, I'll slice them very thin so that because it can be kind of an overwhelming flavor but uh i i most often will roast them i'll pickle them i've got a video pretty good video i think on how to pickle the beets those are my preferred method but for for red beets in particular but the golden beets i love growing the golden beets because I, the golden beets don't have as strong a flavor as the red beets and it's the golden beets that I actually eat raw more than the red beets. And the same thing, just, just a really thin slice or slivers to put into a salad. And so I, I'll, I'll make my salad with, with lettuce from the garden. And I'll usually put in some mint from the garden and some basil from the garden. And then different greens like kale and maybe some charred leaves. And I, when I make a salad like that, my radishes as well and my tomatoes, my cucumbers. And then I'll put in some little beet slivers or, or, or slices of, uh, of the beets. Oh, it's, it's wonderful because you get all those different flavors. The fresh flavors, the tart flavors the the earthy flavor yeah yeah you should eat beets raw you might not like it but <clears throat> but if you're growing beets definitely try it and it it's it's not like i said it's not for everybody not everybody likes beets but uh but i i do as long as they're not too overwhelming and i, I like to mix them in with something else and so <clears throat> Masabi Gal's asking, <clears throat> is it my imagination or do Chogia beets have poor germination? They never sprout like the others. So th that's a good question. So I didn't grow the Chogia beets this year, um, or, or I think it could be Chogia in Italian. Um, I did them last year, and one of the reasons I didn't do them this year is because I didn't have great success with them last year and so it might not be your imagination uh, it, it could be your garden and that beet in my garden with that beet the golden beets do much better the detroit red do much better and so those are the beets that i tend to grow um i think i think i grew the georgia two years ago as well and, and also had mixed results so I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that it's definitely that variety, but you're not alone. I've, I've also had similar issues and uh, it, it's, and the beet was just okay as far as the flavor. It, it had a much milder flavor than the reds and it's a beautiful beet to grow. And it's beautiful in salads because it's got the, the red and the white on the inside. So it's beautiful for salads and it actually was pretty good in salads but but this year i went with the beets that i knew were grow, going to grow better in the spaces i put them so uh, I, I wouldn't say give up on them yet maybe you can try them next year to see if they do better 
or go ahead and start some now going into fall you, you might find out because uh, I didn't grow them in my fall garden I grew them in my spring garden and that might be one of those kind of plants that does better in a fall garden and so you know experiment a little bit with that and you might find that it, it's something that, that you actually like uh, so Karen says, I just didn't like the taste of canned beets, but I'm not crazy about cooked carrots either. You know, I didn't grow beets for years and years and years because I don't like the taste of canned beets either at all. I won't eat canned beets. But after growing beets, the beets you harvest are nothing like canned beets. And the same with cooked carrots. Depending on how you cook the carrots, um, most of the carrots I've had in my life I did not like cooked either. But when I roast my carrots and my beets and my turnips all together oh man it, it's so good oh usually especially if i have potatoes at the same time that i've grown and i just have a root vegetable root vegetable roast oh, i just absolutely love that that's one of those things that i, I definitely look forward to <coughs> okay let's see frank says i've crosby's egyptian beet seeds i haven't heard of that Bought impulsively, nothing wrong with that. You know, and, and impulsivity is actually a good way to combat the burnout. Just do something totally different. Just be impulsive. And I, I like that idea. So giving a serious try, you'll have to let us know in the future how they turned out. Because that's, that's something I'm not aware of. Shandy's Garden found that my favorite garden snack is frozen ground cherries. A little bit of heaven right out of the freezer on a hot day. Put them in a big zip bag with the paper still on. Good for you. I haven't had good success with ground cherries, but I haven't spent a lot of time really trying to have good success. So I was going to do some of that this year. Didn't get to it. And next year, I'm, I'm going to try to do ground cherries and make them work. But I appreciate that idea for the garden snack. Um, cause I had no thought about that. I've never really had ground cherries and that's why i haven't put a lot of attention into it because i'm not sure how to fix them and what to do with them so thank you a snack from the garden with a ground cherry i, I, I try to remind myself i'll put that in my notes to try next year and see if we can make it happen so um pepper paul asks anyone roast daikon radish i have uh i, I actually did one of those roasts where I was talking about root vegetable roasts and I included some daikon radish in that last year and delicious um, radishes are one of those foods that we often think of as a raw food we eat radishes raw but cooked radishes can actually be quite tasty and and it's something many of us don't have in our diets but the daikon is perfect it's dense and especially if you cube it up to go with those other root vegetables, yeah, it, it, it's actually it's actually pretty tasty. So I would suggest you try that if you haven't done it as well. And uh, then you have to let us know. Uh, Yogi Lai says, my ground cherries are prolific and volunteer every year in the Pacific Northwest. I do start them by seed, though, so I have some early. Good for you. Yeah, you know, not every region like... Those of us in this dry, weird, cold region of the Rocky Mountains, I don't really know any other gardeners that, that grow ground cherries. It's just not something that does well for us in this region, which is why I and pretty much everybody I know in this area don't know anything about ground, ground cherries because we just don't grow them. And I think a big part of it is starting them early because I've tried growing them from seed directly in the garden and it never works. The season just isn't long enough. And uh, this next year, I'll be growing them from seed early and then transplanting them and see if it can work. So good for you. Uh, the DR978 says ground cherries might also be called pineapple tomatillos. That's what my seeds are labeled. Interesting. Yeah, they both have that paper husk around them. And so the tomatillos and the ground cherries look very similar. Typically, the ground cherries are sweeter and the tomatillos are more tart but they could easily be mistaken. And yeah, it doesn't surprise me that a pineapple tomatillo is uh, a, a name for a ground cherry because of that similarity, but also because of that, that taste difference. So cool. Prepper Chris, love the garden, zero burnout, the grass and weeds 
and nightmare makes me want a self-driving lawnmower that's funny yeah the my my son uh suggested i get a riding mower i i because i i showed some pictures and talked about my weeds i have used a lawn mower in the last week to deal with some of the weeds they are just that dense but uh i i no longer have the garden space with all these or the garden design with all these beds to have the self-driving mower I, I have had a driving lawnmower before but not a self-driving lawnmower so good luck with that chris I, I hope you can find something that that works for you gardens happen i guess we'll have to try cooked radishes with all these radishes i'm planning to grow yeah absolutely yeah and and, and there's a lot of recipes out there for cooked radishes and and you can go either way you can either cook the radishes in in like a sweet sauce or you can cook the the radishes and more of a savory sauce and they can really go either way so uh yeah definitely give it a try jay says over the years my success with brown cherries has been variable in 6 a and b none grew indoors this year so i did without there are many names for ground cherries uh yes thank you for that yeah and and you know I, I, i'm in zone 5b of course and that could be a factor just the, how our season starts and how our season ends but thank you for sharing that jay i'm glad i'm not the only one that has had variable success with the, the cherries over the year um <clears throat> And, and so uh, talking about pollen in the garden as well, that's one of those issues. I've been having a lot more allergy issues in the garden. And, and that can actually also add to the burnout where you're tired, you're sore, you got too much to do. Then you get out in the garden and you start having allergy attacks and that starts affecting you. And that just exacerbates the problem. And so recognize... For some of us, there are certain times of year that the allergies are going to be worse than the others and try to anticipate that. So I've been trying all kinds of different types of allergy medications, over-the-counter kind of stuff. And, and I've come across one that I think is working much better than the others. So I just a few days ago, I've discovered it. And already I feel my sinuses are improved and I don't have as much of a reaction as before. So keep your fingers crossed for those of us that have allergies in the garden. Try not to let it get you down. Do try to figure out how you can control it best so that you can get back out in that garden and get that positive energy, which I think help, helps combat almost everything that is going on. So um, Del Peel is saying, wish I could post pics of my garden here. Last year, my ground cherries had like 60 to 100 cherries per plant. Well, it, you can always send me your photos at gardenerscott at gardenerscott.com. I, I, I prefer to have the full garden pictures in my background, but if you'd like to share your garden with us, yeah, send me a picture, gardenerscott at gardenerscott.com. Give me permission to use it. Uh, put it in a, a nice full landscape picture and i'll add it to the queue and and consider as long as it meets those parameters showing it in the background and especially if you point out that that you're growing something like we talk about we're talking about ground cherries and so if any of you have a a garden picture you'd like to share with us and in the background are some of those ground cherries i'll be glad to do it uh, sometimes when it's a picture of just the plant, and, and I'll get pictures like that from some of you from time to time, it really doesn't work in the background because it kind of looks like a Godzilla plant when we put the video out. And so you've got this picture behind me with, with ground cherries the size of watermelons. So that's why I prefer to have the full picture. And then you can tell me about it and we can talk about it when it gets to that point in the show. But yeah, by all means share your pictures and, and even if you don't want to share it with everybody you just want to share it with me by all means feel free to send me your pictures as well and i'll, I'll definitely take a look amy's asking when you cover your crow your rows with plastic and netting for the fall do you tuck it into the raised beds and so the way i have my hoops so my hoops are roughly two feet high some of these like this one is about two and a half almost three feet high and so i'll cut my plastic 
or my netting or my row cover, whatever it is uh, I'm using, a shade cloth to fit the hoop. And I'll actually have it drape over the side of the bed. <clears throat> and so I don't tuck it in. I have it over the hoop and on the outside of my wooden raised beds. And then I just use the spring clamps, the kind that you, you pinch and they open up. And I'll put that at the bottom of the hoops to hold them in place. And it's as simple as that, just throwing the cover over, clamping them in place, and then allow the, the fabric or the material to just drape over the outside of the bed. So it, it, it's, it's all cut to size and it is intentionally cut big so that I don't have to worry about tucking it in. Uh, I used to tuck, uh, but then especially when we get rain or snow and then the water pools up inside that tuck. And so now I just drape it over my raised beds. Now, if you're doing it in the ground, then you'll need to weight down that fabric or that plastic in some way. But that's why I use the, the spring clamps on, on my cattle panel hoops. And, and it works fine. And it holds everything in place without too much trouble. So hope that helps out, Amy. Uh, Garden Sappen says, I think I'm going to take a picture of one of my beds. It's doing just so well. Absolutely. You know, I talk about keeping a garden journal. And a garden journal can be whatever you want it to be. Most of my garden journals have basically been photos that that I'll take and then I'll name the photo with the date I took it or whatever it happens to be that's part of it. And I'll keep those photos in a file by month and year. And that's one way that I document my garden and keep track of what's doing well or what's done well or what's not doing well. And that's part of my garden journal is a photo record of what's happening in the garden. So yeah, absolutely. Get out there and take pictures of your garden. And quite honestly, that's one reason why I, these last or a couple times now in the last month, I've been showing pictures of my garden because this is one of the pictures I took to document my garden for this time of year. And then I, you know, I just shared it with all of you, but I took this picture <clears throat> so that I could show me how well the plants are growing and the sunflowers and everything else I already talked about. And this is one of those things that this picture I'm sharing with you, but, but it's for my photo record for the future. So yeah, absolutely do it. <clears throat> yeah. Yogi Lai says, I love taking photos of my garden. It's so beautiful. I have thousands of pictures of my gardens over the year and occasionally for a video or for some other purpose it's like oh, i need to find that photo help having that that method whatever it is of cataloging your photos in different files is a good idea otherwise it just becomes thousands of photos that you'll never look at so find a way that you can catalog and keep track of them but yeah yeah i love doing it too <clears throat> so Tanya's wondering, does roast mean to bake in an oven? Yeah, basically. So baking is basically just cooking in an oven. Whereas roasting, typically what you're going to do is like toss the vegetables with oil. And then you typically bake at a higher temperature. And so the, the vegetables, you know, we've talked a lot about the root vegetables. So the root vegetables end up becoming browned and maybe crispy on the edges. And so if you just bake potatoes in the oven, you're gonna end up with a potato that is all white or all yellow, depending on the type of potato, and then you eat it. But if you cut the potato into cubes before you put it in the oven, and you cut the carrots and you cut the turnips and you cut the beets and everything else, cut them all about the same size in the cubes, toss them in something like olive oil, put them on a sheet. Don't put them in like a casserole dish, put them in a sheet and then put them in a hotter oven. And that's what the roasting is. The, the oil will actually help crisp up the outside of those root vegetables. 
And so it's not just cooked, it's, it's, it's roasted with, with that oil and that higher heat. You can also roast over a fire and you know we will also often roast meat to get that that same uh, that that brown, crunchy, cooked outside. It's it's kind of the exterior being cooked more than the interior that kind of differentiates the roasting from the baking. But other than that, then yes, they are pretty similar. And yeah, absolutely, Karen, air fryers work very well for roasting. Uh, the part of the most air fryers have that setting like air crisp I think is the one that mine mine calls it and same thing and and again usually you'll you'll toss them in some oil before you put them into your your air fryer and that helps get that outside nice and roasted that that crispy cooked aspect of the outside being the the cooked more than the inside but yeah absolutely an air fryer will definitely work for that and that, that's actually an easy way to do it and yeah Paul uses enameled and clay roasting pans I do too I've got some enamel uh, pans not only pans more like dishes but low dishes and and that's exactly how I do my my root vegetables I'll either use a cookie sheet that has a low rim around it or my enameled pans, toss them in some oil, stick them in a hot oven, and and then wait for that color change and that crispiness. It's it's usually a good idea to stir them or toss them halfway through so that all the sides get cooked pretty evenly so you have that nice, that crisp all the way around it. Uh, but you don't have to do it halfway through. That's just one of those techniques to try to make it uh, a little bit better. And uh, so absolutely, yeah, as he says, skewer roasting is yummy. Another great way to do it. Yeah, put, put whatever you're roasting on a skewer and put it over an open fire, or you can put that in a hot oven or under the broiler. Another great way to, to use some of the stuff in your garden. So Jay says, I do a tray of roasted root vegetables every time I use my oven. Good for you. That's, that's great. I, I'm not quite... Uh, that good about doing it every time, but good for you, Jay. I think that's that's awesome. So Shandy's garden. I've got scarlet runner beans going up both sides of a trellis and royal burgundy bush beans below. Good for you. Yeah, just uh, just a few days ago, I harvested some of my royal burgundy beans and also some of my rattlesnake beans together. And so that's, that's I think that's kind of like we're talking about growing different varieties of radishes. I think growing different varieties of beans same kind of thing especially when you can harvest the different ones mix them together make a colorful bean dish good for you i think that's fantastic <coughs> okay um let's let's see what else let's do um sherry and solo hand more green peppers one plant is growing peppers dark purple or blackish color is this something serious or happens sometimes is it safe yeah they're safe so so Often, uh, and it depends on the pepper, but sometimes if the pepper gets too much sun, it can turn purple. Um, there are purples or peppers, and so it could be the variety of the pepper, but often they'll, they'll start off as green, then they'll start changing color to whatever the final co color is. Most peppers have red as a final color. And as they get into that mode where they're starting to turn red, if they're exposed to a lot of sun, that can throw off the, the cells in the pepper and, and they can become more dark and purple and sometimes almost black. Uh, some peppers are actually made to grow that way. So if it's not one of those peppers, if it's a red pepper that just turned purple, uh, you might look to see if the peppers were growing outside of where the leaves were because the leaves can shade them and help keep that from happening and sometimes it'll be half and half one half of the pepper will have that purple color and the back side that isn't exposed to the sun will have a red color or whatever the color of the pepper is uh, might even be green and purple depending on when that shift happens yeah still edible you may notice a difference in the texture of the skin especially if it did have that excess boost of sun but um, really isn't 
isn't a problem. Just consider maybe shading the peppers in the future so uh, you don't have that concern. So <clears throat> I was asked about how my week was. And so let's get into how my week was. And, and some of you know uh, that this last week I actually lost uh, my garden pal uh, Lily into the uh, the the Rainbow Bridge. She she passed, and it was it was a tough time. It was one of those things that that we we knew it was coming, we knew it was going to happen, and then it just was one of those things that this is the last video I took of Lily in the garden. This was a month ago. And so she was moving much slower. We hadn't seen her in videos in a while. She tended to stay in the shade. And I, I like all of you who are pet lovers, it was a tough time. And that, that happened at the end of last week's live stream. That's why I made the comments that I did. And so it, it was a rough start to the week dealing with our loss of Lily. And she was a big part in so many of the videos. Though some of those very first videos that I made 10 years ago, you can actually see Lily in, in some of the shots. She just would poke her head in from time to time. And then in recent years, she played a much more active role in some of my videos. And then in the last couple of years, she just hasn't been that active in the garden. And Mala now is, is very active in the garden. Well, we don't have Lily with us anymore, and that is hard. It took me a, a number of days, as you might expect, to, to recover. And you never fully recover, but you do have to grieve. And so I spent much of my early week grieving because it, it is such such a hard thing to go through when you lose someone you love even you know our furry friends are part of the family so so it was hard it was tough but then the end of the week was completely different and so i actually traveled this weekend to go see my son and uh saturday my son got married and so I was with him in Louisiana. This is a picture of, of the two of us. I escorted him down the aisle to, to where he was marrying his, his beautiful bride in Louisiana. And so it was a wonderful week. It was one of those kind of weeks where, where it started off so terribly, but ended so wonderfully. And... And so that roller coaster can really play with your emotions. But I can use both ends of this last week. And I, I remember so many good times with Lily in the garden. And now, you know, of course, my son with his big beard in Louisiana, starting his family with the love of his, li his, his life, uh, I can focus on them. And and their life and we talk almost every day and it was a wonderful wedding it was exactly what they hoped it would be and so it's it's life that's what happens with our life is we have those down in the gutter moments where it never seems like things are going to get better and then it ends with a new daughter-in-law and a new marriage and a new hope for the future for everybody in my family. So I, I appreciate you asking earlier about how my week was because it was a crazy week. <laughs> it was absolutely crazy. And so because I was was distressed and, and feeling so bad about Lily, I didn't get a lot done in the garden at all. I just didn't feel like going out to the garden. And that's why I wanted to talk about the burnout this week because I was just, I was burned out of, of so many things. I was burned out emotionally. I was burned out physically. And even though the garden is a place of solace, it was hard to get in the garden. 
But then after a few days, I did. And once I got out into the garden, I started feeling the energy, Lily's energy, the energy of the plants and the garden as a whole, and I started feeling better. So that by the time I left on Thursday to go visit my son and then spend the next four days involved with the wedding activities, I could then focus on the the positive and the enjoyment and the family and the friends and all the other aspects that that a wedding brings. And so that's that's why I wanted to to bring this subject up today because sometimes it's burnout. We call it burnout. It could be a lot of other things that impact what we're doing in the garden and when we're doing it and how much we're doing it and whether we're even doing it at all. And so my garden hasn't had much attention in the last week. I I had someone staying at my house and they'd help take care of the garden and they helped take care of Mala. And so as far as the garden and Mala was concerned, life was pretty much normal. But for me, it wasn't. And now today, this is the time that I'm going back to the garden. This is the day that I'm focusing on some of those tasks, some of those things that need to be done. And now I'll line out my garden week, like we've already talked about, with what I'm going to do. So today is just get back into the garden day. I'm not planning on doing anything. I'll, I'll see if watering even needs to happen because it's been rainy the last couple of days while I was gone. If I don't need to water, I'm not watering. I'm just going to spend some time in the garden and get to know my garden again. And then tomorrow, I'll focus on another task. And Wednesday, I'll do another task. And then I'll gradually get back into the gardening that I like to do. Because this has been a roller coaster emotional week that I've had. And I'm just not ready to jump back into it. I need to move back into it slowly. And so I'm using this as an example for you that when those things happen in your life, in your garden, whatever it happens to be, the garden is a place to go to to get that, that energy, to re-energize yourself. But you don't have to do it all at once. You can do it slowly. You can do it whatever works best for you. And I've decided what works for be best for me is to get to know my garden again. Because I had reached that point where I knew things were bad with Lily. I was starting to get burned out. And then I was done. I needed some time off. I've had the time off and I'm back. So I'm back to making videos. I'm back to enjoying the garden. I'm back to getting all the benefits that the garden gives me. And I'm looking forward to it. And life is good. I have Mala. Mala loves the garden. And we will remember Lily with so much love and fondness and keep moving forward because that's what gardens teach us. Every day is different. Every day brings something new and looking to the future really helps out. And It's not just with the garden, it's with life in general as well. So I look to my son and his friends and his family and that helps me as well as I look 5, 10, 20, 25, 30 years into the future. And I start thinking about my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren and every other memory we're able to achieve in those years ahead. So I hope that inspires you, not only within the garden, but within your day-to-day -day life, making those memories, acknowledging what's important in your life, those furry friends, the family, sitting in the garden and being with nature. Whatever it is, relish those moments because they disappear too quickly. And unless you've taken the time to highlight what's important to you, it might be lost forever. And I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want it to happen to you. So enjoy your garden this week. Make those memories, get energized, Fight that burnout so that you have many years of good gardening ahead. And I hope it all starts with this week and today. And that you have a wonderful time 
well, until we meet again next Monday and do it all over again. So have a great gardening week. I'll see you here same time, same place next week, and we'll talk about gardening then. I'm Gardener Scott, and always enjoy gardening.